everyone. Good morning. All right, well, we're going to get started here and um, just kind of dive in. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit with you of something that I experienced a couple weeks ago. So I had the honor of leading worship for a youth camp um, two weeks ago. So me and a couple of my buddies traveled to Iowa and um, it was an amazing time. There's so many stories that I could share with you of what God did, how the Holy Spirit showed up. I have never seen that generation worship so fiercely. And it just blessed my heart to be a part of and to, to lead in that context. It honestly was really easy for me to lead because I didn't have to be on mic half the time. They just sang the songs and they knew them and they were singing out and it was awesome. And so before those sessions, we would have a prayer time. And so it went out as a blast to all the students, all the leaders, hey, if you wanna come and pray at 6.15 and just pray over our session and pray for the Holy Spirit to move, you can join us. And so there was no real incentive to be there other than just being in the presence of God and preparing our hearts for worship. And there was a couple hundred students and leaders at this camp. And when I tell you that at 6.15, the doors open and hundreds of students came to prayer. Probably over two thirds of the entire um, amount of people that were there because they were so hungry to see God move. They were so hungry for a touch of the Holy Spirit. And so I have just been praying ever since that moment that um, over those couple days that we would just be a church that does the same that we would just love the Holy Spirit and we would long for the presence of God, not because of anything that we get from it other than just closeness with God. And so we're gonna sing a song. This first song is really about that, just asking God to show us his glory, to make his presence known to us in this place. And it's really a song of desperation of God. Would you just come, would you meet us? And so go ahead and take a posture of worship right now, whether that's standing or sitting or kneeling, arms stretched out, and we're just gonna have a prayer moment together. We just did this in the green room actually, and it was very special. But I'm gonna open us in prayer, but before we do that, I'm gonna count us down from three, and we're all together with one voice gonna say, Holy Spirit, come. And that's gonna be our prayer to start this morning, okay? So would you just stretch out your hands? as we pray this together. So I'll count us down from three and we'll say, Holy Spirit, come. So three, two, one. Holy Spirit, come. So Holy Spirit, we invite your presence to be with us this morning, to be known to us, Lord. We just wanna be close to you. We wanna be a body of believers that are desperate for your presence. We want to know you deeply, Lord. And so would you come, the Holy Spirit come, in Jesus' name, amen. One, two, three, four.
My God, it is you I seek. For you, my body yearns. For you, my soul thirst. In a land parched, lifeless, and without water, I look to you in the sanctuary to see your power and glory. For your love is better than life. My lips shall ever praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands, calling on your name. My soul shall be sated as with choice food, with joyous lips, my mouth shall praise you. I think of you upon my bed. I remember you through the watches of the night. You indeed are my savior. And in the shadow of your wings, I shout for joy. My soul clings fast to you. My right hand upholds me.
remember those times that he's brought you through. His character is proven true. here that means a lot of change is coming up and in those seasons of change it is so hard to keep our eyes at least for me my eyes focused on Jesus and I was getting caught in the details and I received a text from one of our other residents Aaron in the children's ministry 
And she just said, isn't it so amazing that we get to be a part of what God is doing? And she talked about baptisms that we've gotten to be a part of, child dedications that we've gotten to celebrate here on this stage. But I also know that she knows all the behind the scenes ways that God is working in my life and in hers. And it was such a beautiful reminder to me that God is still faithful even when I choose not to look at it. But it's on me to turn my eyes towards him. And so this morning I wanna ask you, where has God been faithful? that he's inviting you to remember this morning. I just wanna pray over you as you ponder that. Where has he been faithful? Or maybe it's not right now, maybe it was a couple years ago, maybe it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I don't know. But where have you seen God's faithfulness? Would you pray with me? God, we are so thankful for you. God, it is so amazing how you can work in each and every one of our lives in so many unique ways all at the same time. God, we thank you for your presence, for your holiness, and for choosing to be in a relationship with each and every one of us. God, we just give you the glory for the ways that you have been faithful to us, for the ways you have moved, for those things that are coming to mind right now, even for dec from decades ago that we forgot about. And Lord, we put our sight on you this morning and we thank you. And God, all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. My name is Heidi White and I, like I said, I am a resident in the student ministry here at Frontline. And I just wanna welcome you here today. We have already met the Holy Spirit this morning and we are just so glad that you are here and I'm especially going to extend an, a welcome to those of you who are new. Maybe this is your very first time joining us, or maybe this is one of the first times you're joining us. You've, you've been here a few times, and I just want to say welcome. We are so glad that you chose to come to Frontline this morning. In fact, our staff was so excited that you were coming, we actually bought you lunch already. That's right. It is newcomer's lunch today. And so if you are new, maybe this is your first time coming, or if you've been here for a while, but you're just looking to get plugged in still, newcomer's lunch is a great opportunity to meet other people in a similar place, um, but also to ask your questions and learn more about what's happening at Frontline. And so after second service today, if you just want to head over to our student space behind those big old barn doors in the back, we would love to just spend time eating lunch together and getting to know you more. Um, we have a ton of things happening at Frontline, like I mentioned previously, and we actually need your guys' help to make literally all of it happen. Um, one thing that we have coming up at the end of this month is called our summer celebration. I know we've talked about it. We are so excited about it, but what you may not know is that we need bodies. We need your help. We need volunteers to make that happen. This event is designed to meet, reach people in our community, as many as will come. And that also means that we have over 80 spots of, for volunteers that still need to be filled. And so if you pull out your phone and you go to frontlinegr.com slash celebration and you go literally all the way about down to the bottom, you'll see this tiny button that says sign up to serve and we need you to serve. This is a great opportunity to meet other people who are plugged in. Maybe if you're not serving in a specific area, but this day you happen to be free, this is your chance to get to know other people and to join us in how God is going to move in incredible ways in, at the end of summer celebration. So that's on August 25th. Um, and I just wanna invite you to ask the Lord if he's calling you to serve in that way. You guys have already stepped up in so many ways this summer. We had our students camp in June and then our kids camp actually here in July. And we were able to reach over 200 kids and students that were able to encounter God in a new way. And those camps would not have been made possible without you guys giving your time, but also of your financial resources. Camp is expensive. There's a lot of things that go into it. And so I just want you to know we have other things coming up that we would love to do but we do need the financial resources and your time to make them happen. And so today, I just want to invite you to ask the Lord, what is he inviting you to step into? And what are ways he's inviting you to give towards Frontline today? Um, 
One of those ways that we can also serve and reach our community is actually our product drive. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but you actually have a bag on your seat. It might be under you, you might have sat on it, but this is not for your morning coffee. It is actually for our product drive. We are getting ready for the school year and we're partnering with two amazing ministries. One of them is our very own essential store. It's right outside in the lobby. And that essential store meets, reaches over 400 families every single month by just providing those essential items, like literally soap to families in need. Our other ministry that we are partnering with is called Hand to Hand, Frontline Partners with Hand to Hand, who goes out into the Northeast School District to provide over the weekend meals for kids that don't have access to them at home. And so today we're inviting you to join us all month long for this product drive. If you notice, there's a list of items on that bag. And right now I would love if you pulled it out and you looked at it with me. And we're going to move into a time of prayer. Um, and I want you to ask God, what are one or two items that you can grab at the grocery store on your errand run and you can put in this bag to then bring back to just meet these families in our community? That is one small way that we get to spread the love of Jesus to our community, to people who are not saved for the most part. And so right now I wanna move us into a time of prayer and I want you to ponder that question of what is God highlighting that I can give towards this product drive? Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Lord, we thank you for the, all the amazing ways you are moving in our church and all the families that you are going to reach through this product drive. God, I ask that you would highlight one or two items that each person in this room can give towards this product drive. God, we never want to underestimate how you're going to use this opportunity that we have to just give an item, an essential item of food product and how you're going to use that for eternity. And so we ask for your wisdom and guidance in that this morning. Amen. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's just good to see all of you. If you're here in person, it's great to have you. If you're joining and watching online as well, uh, we're starting off a brand new series today, as you can tell by the video behind me. And uh, to get into that, uh, how many of you, just by show of hands, have ever played the game Life? Any of you played this? Who, who am I working with here? Okay, a lot of you. So you've played this game life before. I've got three boys. My oldest is five. His name is Judah. And so for Christmas this last year, he was given the game of life. So we sat down and we were playing with it uh, during the holiday season and we had a lot of fun. And so we were playing and I was the banker. So if you don't know the premise of the game, you get to spin this little dial here and however many spaces you get is what you get to progress and you work through the whole game. There's significant life events. I mean, you get married or you have kids or you go to college, you get your first job. There's different cards where you get to find out like what kind of house are you going to get or what kind of job do you change that job. I mean, a lot of it is similar to what all of us experience in life. And so you get to the end and then you retire and you take the off ramp and then you get to kind of enjoy that season. And so it's, it's kind of a fun game, right? It's teaching a five-year-old kind of some significant things to look ahead at in life. So we're playing the game. I'm the banker. I'm handing out the money and doing the cards and all of that stuff. And so we get to the end of the game and Judah looks at me at five years old and he goes, okay, who won? And I, I said, well, nobody wins in the game of life. It's about having fun. Like that's, that's the goal. And he goes, oh, Okay, well, how much did I end with? And so I counted it up. And so here's what Judah ended with. He ended with $1.46 million uh, and a house. So I was like, good job, buddy. And he goes, thanks. And he takes off. <laughs> Naturally, then I had to count how much I had because people do win in the game of life, don't they? <laughs> 
I wanted to know. I mean, I felt bad for him the whole game. I'm like, I'm smoking you. Like, how big is my margin on my five-year-old? So after I counted up mine, Judah's was 1.46 and a house. Uh, I counted mine up, and I was 1.36 and no house. And immediately, I felt like a loser. I mean, isn't that, think, think about this premise here for one second. Isn't it funny how money works in our lives? That one moment we can look at everything that we have and we feel happy, we feel joy, we feel satisfied, we feel like it's more than enough, we've enjoyed the game or the process or whatever it is that led us to that amount. At one moment, the same amount can make us feel all of those happy things and then at the, at the same time make us feel like a total loser. Feels like we're so far behind feels like we're struggling or it causes fear and anxiety and it causes all these other thoughts to, to kind of formulate significant life decisions that we make as a result. What's funny is the same amount of money can change somebody's life forever. And that same amount of money can ruin somebody's life forever. Money, money is kind of this neutral object. It's a, it's a thing. It's a thing that all of us deal with. It's a thing that all of us work with and work on and accumulate and spend every single day of our lives. We're constantly making money and financial decisions. And so here's the thing. We're starting a brand new series today. It's called Affordable, and we're talking about money for the next few weeks because, let me be super clear, it's something every single one of us deals with. So today... There's no financial campaign, so I just want to brace you for the end of the sermon. There's no financial campaign. There's no significant ask. There's no building campaign. There's no significant need that we're going to go, surprise, we need you to give. We want nothing from you in this series. We're looking at all of us, looking at us as pastors and as staff. We're looking at you, those who call Frontline Home, you that maybe attend here just on a, on a whim today, and you kind of walked in and you went, what is this? You deal with money, and believe it or not, the Bible has a lot to say about money. In fact, it was one of Jesus' most talked about topics. So today, we're not going to ask you for anything, but we, we honestly believe that God has something for you if you lean into it. So before you write me off, before you check out, before you say, I don't really trust you, uh, let me talk about a couple of these things. How our, our society handles money is kind of whack. So if you look at 1990 until now, do you know the middle class wealth has increased 82%? That feels pretty good, right? Anybody feel like you want to pat yourself on the back? 82% increase since 1990. Here's some of the realities, though, of the culture and society in which we live in today here in the United States. Nearly two-thirds of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. And that includes one-third of the top earners in our country. In 2023, it said that 63% of Americans reported that money was a major stressor in their lives. The American Psychological Association says 81% of Gen Z is stressed about money. 87% of Americans say economic pressures is their number one cause of stress. So there's a strong misalignment that we're seeing. And just if we open our eyes and if we look at the society in which we live or the, the country in which we reside, we just hit a significant mile marker this last week of having $35 trillion of debt as a country. And you add it up, depending on what your numbers look like, that's between 90 and $100,000 per U.S. citizen that would be responsible to pay that off if we paid it off today. The way our society deals with money isn't working well. And it causes a lot of stress and pain and anxiety and fear, and it happens not just on a, on a macro level, but on a micro level. It affects marriages and families. It affects uh, decisions that you can make for job and where to live. There, there's so much that's encompassed with money, and, and God actually has a lot to say. So let me tell you about that part. Money and possessions are referenced in the Bible more than 800 times. Isn't that amazing? It's the second most referenced topic in the Bible. There's more than 2,300 verses on money, wealth, and possessions compared to 500 verses on faith and prayer. Jesus talked about money a lot. 15% of his preaching was about money, and 11 out of his 39 total parables were about money. So let me dive into the text that we're in today. It's going to be Luke chapter 12. Jesus is talking to a group of people, and he's talking to them about the kingdom of God. 
He's looking at people and he's not saying, I want to get something out of them and I want to get access to their wallets or their bank accounts or anything like that. He's looking at his people and he loves these people and he's trying to teach them, here's the whole world that exists right in front of you that I'm inviting you into, that I want you to be a part of. And it involves money and relationships and family and conflict. And Jesus invites them in to go, but I want you to understand the true richness of what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. And then somebody interrupts him. It says, if I I was preaching right now about this, and then somebody goes, I have a question, I would like a response. And here's what happens to Jesus in the middle of his sermon. Luke 12, verse 13, it says this. Someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me? I love that he says, man. Can we just acknowledge that? I just feel like this is bro Jesus for a second. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me judge or an arbiter between you? And then he said to them, watch out, pause. Let me say to all of us, watch out. Watch out, Jesus says, be on your guard against all kinds of, interesting word choice, greed. Watch out, you gotta watch out. Jesus says you gotta watch out for greed, be on your guard, watch out against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. That's the text that we're focusing on today. Jesus talking about the kingdom of God takes the interruption and what he does with it is he says, we're going to make a life lesson out of this for everybody. I just feel bad for the guy that raised his hand. I bet it's the last time he did that. Because Jesus then unpacks this whole text and this whole parable, and we're going to unpack that parable together for the next three weeks, but we can actually do a lot with that passage right there. Jesus says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Do you think greed was the thing that the guy was aware of that was going on in his heart when he asked Jesus to speak into it? No. He, he's saying, we, we have a family dispute, Jesus, and you seem like you know what you're talking about, so, so speak into this and tell my brother that he's wrong. That's basically what he's asking. So Jesus kind of cuts through it, and, and he doesn't see the problem as fairness, Jesus doesn't speak into fairness. He doesn't speak into relationships between in-laws. He doesn't speak into communication or priorities or siblings. The problem that Jesus addresses by seeing the actual root issue is greed. Ecclesiastes verse 5 in the Old Testament, it says this, Whoever loves money never has enough. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Something that's true about people, people back then, people today, people at the beginning of time, something that's just true about people is we all have this inner dialogue that's talking to us all the time. And it's so regular and it's so consistent and it actually sounds a lot like your voice, so much so that you become unaware of the, the verbiage and the phrases and the statements that you begin making to yourself all the time. Let me give you some examples. Uh, have you ever heard yourself say this, it's never quite enough? We all have this money talk in our minds. Some of you might say it's never quite enough, or on the flip side, you might say, I will always have enough. It'll always be there. It'll always show up. Maybe for you it's this, money exists to buy my enjoyment. And so you have purchases and things in your garage and in your house and the subscriptions that you have because money exists to buy your enjoyment. Or you may be on the other side of the spectrum and you may say, money exists to secure my future. Can we have the savers say amen in the room? They're quiet right now. Okay. All right. We'll work up to it. Here's this next one. Saving is the key to happiness. Or on the other side of the spectrum, spending is the key to happiness. Do I have any spenders in the room? They're more nervous. Okay, guys, we got to loosen up. This is a fun topic here. How about this one? Debt is good if it leads to higher returns. Or on the other side, debt is bad all the time. A house is an asset or a house is a liability. Now, here's why all of you are nervous. I'm going to bet on anything. If you're married, it's because you and your spouse disagree. There's all the nervous laughter. You're like, he said the thing out loud. The problem is so many people, when they get married or they start dating and then they have a family, they find out when it's too late, we are not on the same page at all. Okay, all right. I'm preaching. I've been ready for this one. 
This is funny, man. Every one of us makes decisions based on these statements and beliefs that we hold true to our hearts. But when we're not on the same page, and even more so, it's not just on the same page with each other. It's when we're not on the same page with God that it leads us down a path that leads towards awful endings and awful circumstances that none of us would ever choose. It leads down the path of divorce or bankruptcy or credit card debt that becomes so cumbersome it traps you like golden handcuffs where you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything. In fact, sometimes people are so riddled with debt or or purchases, decisions that they've made earlier in life, like school or college education or car loans or house loans that that you couldn't afford, so often those speed up to the point that later in life you go, we are stuck and we don't know what to do and we're so misaligned with what the Bible says, with what God says, with what each other has said that now we're stuck and we don't know what to do and where to go and it leads towards a life of stress and anxiety and pressure and pain and we wonder, God, why would you do this to me? Now let me take this back and say if you read this book that God has preserved for us for thousands of years, the second most referenced topic is what? Money. God actually has something for us. He doesn't want something from you. He doesn't want to take from you. But God's got a set of principles and priorities in the kingdom that he has built and established and invited all of us into. And what he promises is when we can align ourselves with him, when we can actually mean the songs that we just sang, when we say we, we build our foundations on him and we align our financial and money purposes around him and how we use it and how we steward it, when we actually use our stuff and our money in a way that is in line with him, it actually leads to a totally different outcome in life. So that's why we're going to spend all of this time for the next couple weeks on money. So let me get personal with you, okay? Um, Money uh, is probably the number one cause of stress and anxiety in David. What's funny is if I look at my life even up to this point, uh, I can look at certain decisions and say, those were great decisions. I mean, a wonderful decision there. It was in line with the Bible and in line with what God says and how he talks about money. And it led towards a lot of the fruit that I would hope to see, peace and you know, ability or freedom to respond when God gives me an invitation or asks me to be generous somewhere. But then at the exact same time, I can look at other areas of my life and go, I disqualify myself from preaching this message. Then I can see the effect that led towards anxiety and fear and crippling anxiety to the point that that it it leads me to this freak out spot. Some of the worst panic attacks slash anxiety moments that I've ever had in my life, I can trace back to some root cause surrounding money. I've lived this. I've kind of lived both spectrums. I remember my family, we moved uh, as a family. My dad's a pastor as well. So we moved in July of 2008. It was on my birthday. And we moved in July, and then as you know, a couple months later, the economy crashed, the recession hit. And so one of the most formative seasons of my life was watching us as a family who was quite over-leveraged in a couple different areas just get whooped on for the next two years. And it shaped me, and it shaped how I saw money to the point that it didn't actually line up with this. I swung to the opposite side, and I just went, I need money, and I need it to be in control. Can anybody else relate to that? When I was growing up, my dad always taught us this thing. Uh, When we would get allowance, um, you know, we had jobs to do around the house and things that we would do and contribute to as a family. When our dad would give us money, you know, let's say $10, we would always take the first 10%, so it was the first dollar that would go back to God. So it was always on the top, and dad would describe me and say, this is tithing. This is part of what the Bible talks about. So tithing, you take that first 10% and you give it back to God as a reminder that all of it is from him. Even though you worked, even though you earned or you sold something or you made good decisions, the ability and the situation and the circumstances that surrounded it was a gift from God. So the first 10% goes back to God. Then my dad would say the second 10%, so another dollar goes to savings. And then he would say, and then you can spend 80%. And that was awesome. I loved that. 
especially as a young kid. But here's, here's the problem that as I've grown older, and I think all of us have experienced, uh, in that next 80%, now you have to make decisions about buying a house, getting married, having children. What about adopting a pet, changing jobs, paying for college, going on vacation, retiring? What about being generous with the church? What about supporting missionaries? What, what do you do with this other 80%? There's so much flex and it requires us to actually take a step back and go, what, what is the basis by which we handle such an important thing like money? Because it's like a nuclear reactor in the right hands with wisdom. It can change people's lives. It can help. I mean, it, you think about what you can accomplish when you're stewarding money well. It can make a tangible, palpable difference in your own family, in your own marriage, and in your own community and context and all over the world for the sake of the kingdom of God. But it's also like a nuclear reactor that burns down if you can't handle it wisely because it wreaks havoc and destruction and chaos and it brings fear and anxiety everywhere you go. Jesus knows how important money actually is and that's why he invites us in to build our lives on a totally different foundation. So if I had to summarize it, if I had to say this a little bit differently, what I would say is this, is we need to understand that money is a tool, not a foundation, to build our lives on. So many of us have taken money or our income or our net worth or whatever it is that we, we seem to control, whether it's liquid assets or permanent assets or whatever the verbiage is for you finance people, we, we've taken that and said, well, this must be the foundation by which I build my life on. But if we look at the Bible and what Jesus describes, he says money is a tool. So I brought a tool up with me right here. Uh, it's a Dewalt drill, 12 volt. It's got some power. I like that. I feel a little bit like uh, Tim the Toolman Taylor when I get something like this. If we can go back to home improvement days with Tim Allen, any of you, it's a little slow to catch up, that's fine. Uh, I look at something like this. Uh, we were just at my parents' house in Midland yesterday, and so my dad's building this big barn at his house. And uh, I'm out walking out there, and there's trusses hanging down, and the beams are there, and you get sand all over the place. And, you know, he's building something. So the, the way that most of us approach money, I think, and this is what Jesus was trying to communicate to the crowd, is we show up, and we find something like this on the job site, and we go, wow, this is amazing. You see what this can do? I mean, turn back and forth. It's got one and two. I still don't know what that does. It's got the trigger. <laughs> kind of speeds up, it's rechargeable, battery. Like what, what we do, it's kind of silly, isn't it? It feels weird. We, we obsess over the tool and we miss what the tool can build. This thing can build a house, it can build a barn, this can build a skyscraper, this can build a community center, this can build a hospital, this can build so many things if it's used in the right way. This can also tear apart things, can it? It can undo a building or a hospital or a skyscraper or a doctor's office or a dentist's office or an auto garage or a car. It's funny how the same tool can be used to build something up as it can to tear it down. And this is not the foundation. You can't build a house on top of a bunch of DeWalt drills. Haha, <laughs> get it? You can't build the foundation of your life on money. That's why Jesus spent so much time talking to his people, preserving this for us, because we are prone to doing the exact same thing. Let me turn our attention to Philippians 4, verse 11. I love this one because money is it's like such a great equalizer because we all deal with it and we all have it, whether we have a high net worth, a low net worth, whether we're high income earners or low income earners, whether we're followers of Jesus, whether we're not. You may say, I have no relationship with Jesus. Why should I do that? What I would tell you is if you align your life with the way that Jesus handles money, you will experience some of the fruits of that as well. But Jesus invites us into something even better, something even more. He invites us to build our foundation on something that actually can last. So he says this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, uh, Paul is writing this, the apostle Paul who gave his life to Christ, he's writing to this church and he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. He's talking to them about giving and being generous. He's saying, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. 
For I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. But then he says this, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Do you notice do you notice the attention here of that last line that Paul gives his audience? He begins talking about circumstances and money and when we have enough or when we don't have enough, when we have a lot or we don't have a lot. He's saying, I've learned the secret to be content. The, the secret is not in the circumstances which are constantly changing. It's a moving target. He's saying, I, I've learned that the secret of contentment, the secret of having enough, not on the outside, but on the inside, is not in a what, if I use this, the secret of contentment is not in a what, but a who. And here's the biggest piece you could get. The who is not you. That's how most of us function. I feel content, I feel happy, I feel provided for, I feel in control when I'm actually in control. Most of us, the way we handle money and finances is not for the purposes of anything outside of us. It's about me. It's what do I want, what do I think, what do I believe, and what Jesus is inviting his people to do is to say, your foundation is bad because you're building everything on top of it. And the problem is when you have a bad foundation, you could have a great everything else, but when your foundation goes, it will all come crumbling down. Jesus said the, the greatest foundation you can have is me. That's his invitation. You can imagine the look on the guy's face that interrupted him, can't you? Jesus, tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. Build your life on me. Any other questions? It's basically what he said, isn't it? It's true. It's loving. If you go back to the game of life, so many of us are playing that same game of life. We have a scorecard, and we know how we're doing. Maybe it's based on stuff, maybe it's based on numbers, maybe it's based on time, maybe it's based on freedom. We know kind of where we're at on that scorecard, but how's your scorecard with God? You feel like your life is firm, steady, rooted? Are you experiencing some of the, the aspects of following Jesus, especially in the realm of your finances, but by translating that into peace? Do you have that in your life? Or when you look at money and stuff, is that, is that a place or a source of anxiety, fear, or even greed? Such a sleeper sin has so much power, yet most of us don't even realize when it's at work in our own lives. Jesus' invitation, if I think about the game of life, Jesus' invitation is to build our lives and to build our scorecards around him. And who better to trust. The temptation is to say, well, Jesus lived 2,000 years ago and it's way more sophisticated today and it's way harder, but the principles of, of the created life and world and order have not changed. In fact, the complexity has led us farther away from Jesus rather than toward him. So Jesus, who loves you, believe this or not, who needs nothing from you, but actually deeply cares for you, loves you, wants you to do well, like a loving father invites you to come to him to build your life and to build your foundation and to build your retirement and to build your money and to build your job and to build everything on top of him as a foundation. Who better to trust than the one who created all things and then saw us in our own depraved state? who couldn't figure it out on our own, whose sin and poor decisions were what really caught up to us and it had led to an eternal separation between us and God. And then God stepped in and said, I'm gonna give my son who's gonna live a perfect life, who's going to substitute himself for all of us 
and he's going to go to the cross and he's going to die a brutal death and he's going to defeat sin and death once and for all. And then he's going to resurrect three days later and he says he did it because he loved us. Who better to trust than him? So just as we close, I mean, I I just want to ask you just to dream for a second. Imagine how different your life could be right now in your marriage if you and your spouse were on the same page with what God says about money. That half of the struggles or pain or anxiety or conflict that exists right now would fall off because you're actually centered on the same foundation together. How much would it change your family? Maybe you come from a family that has generation after generation after generation of pain and hardship and toil, conflict around money and division and brokenness. What if you could change your family tree, not just financially, but spiritually in how you handle your money? Think about the generations that could trace it back to you and say when they made the decision to orient everything around God, it changed our family forever. Think about some of you who are just so overcome with stress and anxiety and pressure and fear. Imagine if if the outcome for you could be totally different. It could be peace, joy, contentment, much of what Paul just described. God actually desires those things for all of you. Think about what your yes could be if invited by God into something extraordinary. I fear that a lot of us could not say yes if God said, I'm here. And I pick you. And I want to put you over here in this context. And I want you to be able to do this, whether it's to support somebody, whether it's to move your family, whether it's to move to another part of the world, whatever it may be, what your yes could be in line with your purpose. But you have to say no because you've not oriented your money around him. God's got so much for us. And he loves us. And he wants us to experience all that he has for us in this life, but it has to take, it has to require a first step from us. So how I wanna close just this message, um, I'm gonna put a slide up here. Uh, It just says, need help, need some help stewarding your resources for the kingdom of God? Do you just need help? Do you wanna take a next step? Do you wanna explore this journey together? We're just trying to make ourselves available to you as a church to walk with you in this. There's no judgment. We're not going to ask any imposing or personal questions or anything like that. We're we're not trying to get something out of you for this. We simply just want to walk with you as a church and help point you to what the gospel and what the Bible actually says about us. So if you actually went to this link, because I see nobody's phone coming out for this. So frontlinegr.com slash affordable. You can look it up later. On that side, here's three things. The first one is a free resource from something called the Ron Blue Institute, and it highlights the principles of what it looks like to actually build your life and to build your finances on the kingdom of God. Leads you through this small exercise. We did it as a staff already. It was extraordinarily helpful because at least it puts on paper, where are your percentages going right now? And what does God actually have to say about that? It's very rooted in scripture. So there's a free resource there for you. The second one is something called Financial Peace University. It's a class that we offer, especially for those that are looking to get out of debt. So those that are struggling with that, it's a class by Dave Ramsey and uh, there's a sign up for that if you'd like to be a part of that. The last option on there is just talk with a pastor. You might be in a crisis. You might need spiritual direction or wisdom on that. You may may say, hey, I wanna take some next steps with generosity. I I wanna put this to use in the kingdom. What do I do with that? Or you may say, I wanna talk to somebody else who really knows money inside and out, but who has a kingdom perspective and could speak into that for me. We'll help connect you. I hope you hear this. We want nothing from you. We just want something for you. And I believe God wants something for you as well. So ball is in your court. Whatever it is you want to do, we're going to be here to walk with you every step of the way. So let's close in prayer together. God, we come before you right now and we just thank you for the opportunity uh, to 
steward your resources. How many of yours anyway? You see us like kids. You just love us. And when you look at each one of us, regardless of our situation, regardless of the decisions that we've made or the, the area, maybe we feel shame or guilt around finances. Maybe we feel uh, peace around it or pride or arrogance. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's idolatry. Maybe it's just consumerism. We just want more and more. Whatever it is, we, we know that you still look at us and you see us as your children and you genuinely love us. So I just pray right now, Lord, that, um, that we would check the pride at the door, the arrogance at the door, uh, even the independence at the door. And I pray that we would invite you to this area of our lives because only you can bring hope. Only you can bring peace. Only you can bring true joy. And so we ask you to be our foundation. And as we leave this place, we ask you to help make us different give us a new hope for what could be if we align ourselves with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said together. Amen. 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 I want to invite you to stand with us to sing this uh, last couple songs if you'd like. And I um, just want to encourage you to kind of keep that heart posture of prayer as we sing this song. Not to just sing the words like we sing words to songs sometimes, but make this a prayer to God. We're going to talk about giving our life and our heart to God, and I think this is very, very fitting with what David talked about to make this a conversation with God. Give you my
close our service together, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for leaning in. Uh, thanks for worshiping with us today. Uh, it kind of feels like, like we're ready for what's next, just in the room. And so just my heart, my prayer for you is the same for our church, is that you would experience all that God actually has for you. God's got something for you in this next stage. So uh, two quick things as you leave. The first one is if you need prayer for anything in your life right now, we talked about how money is often attached to a lot of other areas of brokenness in our lives. Uh, if you need prayer for that, we actually moved our prayer wall and the prayer spot from the very back to actually over here on the side of our worship center. So it's a little bit more private. Uh, it's a little bit more set aside. And so if you need prayer over something, you can be as specific or as discreet as you need to. But we've got a whole team that would gladly just pray over you, whatever it is that's going on in your life. The other ones, don't forget those bags that are sitting uh, on your seat. It's just an opportunity for us to make a tangible impact in the lives of people who are struggling in our community as well. So uh, we love to close with a benediction, which just means blessing. So I just want to invite you. You don't have to do this, but if you want to be a part of that, you can extend your hands like this uh, just as a posture of reception. So brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, go in Jesus' peace today. Regardless of the state of your life or your finances or your money, know that God loves you you, that he has a plan and a purpose for your life, and he wants to do good to you in this life, but he has something for you if you are willing to move in his direction, to go in his peace and in his strength and in his wisdom as you go back out into your context this week. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said together, amen. Hey, we love you. We'll see you next week.